You remember that dress that swept the internet a couple months ago? I mean, what's the deal with that? It's like, was it black? Was it gold? Pick a color and stick with it, am I right? And, uh, what about that 90s show, Seinfeld, that started every episode with a stand-up bit? It's like, hello, we know you're a comedian, but this is a sitcom, so get to the episode already, am I right? Internet, welcome to Film Theory, where sometimes we do episodes that aren't about Game of Thrones. So maybe now you're breathing a sigh of relief because you're like, finally, Film Theory will be covering a show I've actually seen, something that I can relate to. Well, hate to break it to you, you youth of the nation, because today we're talking about Seinfeld. No, this episode wasn't pulled from BuzzFeed's latest 90s nostalgia list, 27 struggles that were all too real to 90s kids. We're talking about the series that's widely considered to be the best sitcom of all time. I know that Top Pad of 1995 loved it, and now the series just had a recent resurgence over one specific episode that I just had to talk about. A couple weeks ago, one of the show's stars, Jason Alexander, appeared on the Howard Stern show to talk about his character, George Costanza. I would say that he's the unlovable one of the cast, but basically the whole show revolved around four people who just did awful, awful things all the time. Hilarious things, but legitimately awful things. Give me your wallet! There goes the money for the lipo. <laughs> And yet you still like them. It was pretty incredible. Anyway, at the top of season 7, George gets engaged to a woman named Susan. It's a recurring plot throughout the season, but Jason Alexander revealed in the Howard Stern interview that her sense of comedy was never able to mesh with any of the show's regular cast members. So, as a way to fix the problem, they killed her off. In one of the most bizarre and memorable episodes of the series, Susan dies in the season 7 finale. But it's not her death that's so bizarre, it's the way in which she dies. It's not murder, it's not suicide, it's not even cancer, it's envelopes. Yes, Susan dies by licking her own wedding invitation envelopes. Apparently the uh, glue in the wedding invitations was uh, toxic. <laughs> And the internet being the internet, this issue of course spawned countless medical web forum debates about whether stamp and envelope licking could actually kill you. And for us, it's a question too fun to pass up. So in this episode of Film Theory, my mouth is watering in anticipation of finding out whether a person can die from licking too much envelope adhesive. Get it? Watering? It's a... It's a joke because it's about licking envelopes. It's a stretch, let's move on. To examine whether this plot has any sticking power, huh, I'm on fire today, we need to take a closer look at the circumstances around Susan and the envelopes. We don't ever get a close-up of the envelope itself or the adhesive that kills her, but the show leaves us a couple clues that help us tear open this sticky situation. Don't worry, I'll stop, I'll behave myself. Let's start with buying the invitations. George and Susan go to pick them up from a stationery store in Manhattan where the sales clerk shows them their options. George immediately flips to the back of the binder where the cheapest invitations are kept because, you know, guys just don't really understand all the hoopla around a card that people are just gonna throw out anyway. Google calendar invite maybe? Customize the color or something. Whatever. Anyway, as we learn from the store clerk, the cheapest invitations, the one George happens to choose, have been discontinued for quite some time. They haven't manufactured that one for a number of years. Okay. Why don't they make them anymore? Well, for one thing, the glue isn't very adhesive. So the scene actually tells us a lot. One, the envelopes are old. This episode was produced in season seven of Seinfeld, which aired in 1995. The store clerk says that the envelopes haven't been printed in several years, which leaves us a pretty open window as far as the envelope time frame. Two, the envelopes are cheap. And three, they're not not very adhesive. So let's start with the first piece of evidence, the old envelopes. Believe it or not, the wide world of envelope adhesive science is, well, a thing that actually exists. But even more than that is an area where there have actually been some interesting advances over the course of the last century. Oh man, century! VR better watch out for that emerging envelope tech, oh boy! Anyway, modern envelope adhesives have their roots in World War II packaging and shipping, where the US government needed adhesives that would resist jolting and unsticking in bad weather and trips across the ocean. The majority of adhesives up to that point, and still today actually, 
actually, are solvent adhesives. A solvent adhesive is usually made out of some kind of starch, like potato starch or flour. The idea is that when you get it wet, it gets sticky, and as the water evaporates around it, it hardens. Well, in World War II, they needed something stronger, more resilient. Their answer was a synthetic resin called polyvinyl acetate, or PVAC, PVAC, which is actually derived from petroleum. But unlike the petroleum we use to make gasoline or Vicks Vapo rub, PVAC is a glue. In World War II, PVAC adhesives were used because they were super waterproof and could be used on almost anything. After the war, PVA adhesive was rolled out commercially and started to be used in pretty much everything from sealants to sticky labels on tin cans to envelope glue. In the late 1950s, manufacturers started to change the formulation of polyvinyl acetate to remove its waterproofness. But that seems weird, right? Having watertight seals on envelopes and boxes seems like a really good idea, doesn't it? Well, the primary reason for this change was that the waterproof version was difficult to seal. I mean, think about it. If your adhesive is waterproof, it also makes it resist, well, your tongue. In other words, to get past the waterproof envelope glue, you would have to apply more spit to activate the adhesive, and once you had it sealed, it would take a longer time to dry. Going back to our evidence from the episode, It takes a lot of moisture to make them stick. Doesn't stick well and needs a lot of moisture? Seems like we're getting our answer signed, sealed, and delivered. I'm sorry, I just had to fit one more in. So now we have evidence for the existence of old envelopes that are difficult to seal and required more licks to stick. But that doesn't mean they're poisonous, right? Right? Well, polyvinyl acetate contains trace elements that you wouldn't want to spend an afternoon slurping up, specifically heavy metals, and one in particular, arsenic. Sound familiar? Arsenic is known as the king of poisons, the most famous and one of the most deadly poisons in the world. Inorganic arsenic was the choice poison for royal assassination since before the Middle Ages. It's been implicated in Napoleon's death and was used in some of the first war gases in World War II. And one of its more recent victims? Susan from Seinfeld. In the scene leading up to Susan's death, we see her getting tired of licking envelopes. Then we see her appearing to get lightheaded, kinda woozy, and then she collapses. It's not much to go on, but it does align to the symptoms of arsenic poisoning. If, say, the poison were cyanide, Susan would have started to feel an abrupt shortness of breath, because the poison directly targets respiratory function. For biological weapons like anthrax, the poisoning isn't immediate and can take days or even weeks to kill. With arsenic, though, the first symptoms would be quick and neurological. Dizziness, weakness, and delirium. As we see Susan become more and more sick over the course of the afternoon, we notice her becoming visibly more sluggish, weaker, more tired until she just keels over. The exact way arsenic would kill a bride-to-be. Whoa, wait, wait, Wyoming girl 2215. Don't run to throw away all your envelopes and stamps just yet. PVACs today are considered non-toxic, which is good since it's in school glues. So you keep eating your paste, weird preschooler in the corner. You do you. You do you. So, does that mean we've debunked the show? Heck no! Remember, we're talking about PVAX put on envelopes from the 1950s. You see, today, the Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, is responsible for regulating the amount of dangerous or nasty stuff that makes its way into products we ingest. And that includes adhesives that stick envelopes shut. But, back in the 1950s, the FDA didn't regulate non-traditional food items like stamps or envelopes. Why would they? They're the Food and Drug Administration, not the Food, Drug, and Adhesive Administration. FDAA doesn't have the same ring to it, I guess. In fact, the first regulations on these sorts of glues were, based on my research, either in 1968 or 1973, nearly 20 years later. The invitations we see Susan licking would have been unregulated, untested envelopes, made at a time when no limitations around arsenic levels existed. In other words, as she licked, she would slowly be ingesting decades-old arsenic until eventually dying. Sound unbelievable? Well, it's not. In the late 1890s, people were getting poisoned by their wallpaper, as hangers mixed arsenic into the wallpaper paste. That tacky floral print in the bedroom was literally killing them. So stuff like this isn't unheard of, which means we have one final question to answer. Was there enough arsenic in the envelopes to actually kill Susan? 
Susan. Well, in the season 7 opener, George estimates that Susan is 5 foot 3 inches and about 100 pounds. That small stature means she's gonna be a lot more susceptible to poisoning. I did the calculations and based on her height and weight, Susan would need to consume about 300 milligrams of arsenic to kill her. And so, how many envelopes does she lick? Well, we hear repeatedly through the episode that they're looking at around 200 guests for the wedding. So, let's assume worst case and say that each individual is getting their own invitation. That's 300 milligrams of arsenic spread across 200 invites, or 1.5 milligrams of arsenic per envelope. Sound reasonable? Well, it's not. Quite frankly, it's too much. Way too much. Even with untested glues on the envelopes. For every envelope, the weight of the adhesive strip applied to the flap is about 500 milligrams. At 1.5 milligrams, that would mean arsenic would constitute about 0.3% of the glue. Seems like a small enough number, right? Well, FDA safety standards are defined in units of parts per million, which in simplest terms means that for every million pieces of glue, there can only be a certain number of pieces of arsenic. Right now, the acceptable amount of arsenic in lickable adhesives is set to three parts per million, and a typical formula only requires about two to work. For Susan to have died of arsenic poisoning from licking 200 envelopes, that level would have to be three thousand parts per million. 1,000 times more than where it is today. And quite frankly, that's too much. Let's just look at the anecdotal evidence. History has zero reported cases of this sort of thing happening. If the levels were ever truly that high, brides-to-be would have been dropping dead left and right back in the nifty 50s. In fact, even if we doubled the acceptable amount of arsenic in today's envelopes, she would still have to lick a staggering three million envelopes in a single afternoon. Even if she were somehow able to fully lick an envelope every second, 3 million seconds is the equivalent of 34 days of straight envelope licking, which would no longer put her in the range of acute poisoning, but would kill her from dehydration in a fraction of that time. These pretzels are making me thirsty. And okay, I know what you're thinking, what about cutting her tongue? I thought it too. Well, that certainly does reduce the number that she would need to lick, but only down to a third, leaving a measly one million envelopes to get through. And honestly, George Costanza just doesn't have that many friends. So, long story short, for as brilliant as the Seinfeld series was, and as many panicked WebMD posts as this episode has inspired, it simply isn't possible to be poisoned by licking conventional envelopes. Envelopes. New, old, even with all the tongue paper cuts you want. So sorry, Larry David. It was a good try, and it might have taken us 20 years to get there, but film theory has sealed this one up. Yada yada yada, no soup for you. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut. What's the deal with subscribing? I mean, sometimes my subs see the episodes, sometimes they don't. I mean, why can't the YouTube algorithm just show my videos to everyone who wants to see them? Am I right? Well, you should subscribe anyway. That said, welcome back to the Super, Super Amazing, Amazing End Card, Card Tournament, Tournament, where we have a lot to catch you up on since the channel launched. Don't worry, I'll make it quick. In our recent Fifty Shades of Grey theory, I was able to convince an overwhelming 97% of you that Christian Grey's tactics were indeed the same as cult indoctrination strategies. Then, in Doctor Who Part 1, your favorite villain, winning by 46% of the vote, was the Weeping Angels. In our first Game of Thrones episode, looking at the secrets behind Jon Snow, Tyrion was the overall winner of your favorite character with 57%, with Arya and Danny in a distant second and third, each with about 20. And speaking of Game of Thrones, with our second theory on the subject, I was almost able to convince most of you that my Jorah theory was correct, but with 44%, the majority of you still think that Jon Snow will be the one to slaughter the ice zombies. We'll see how that goes for you. And finally, the last two. In our Future of Movies episode, two-thirds of you said that you were excited about watching movies in 4D, with one-third of you preferring the old-school, lean-back, popcorn-munching experience. And finally, in our How to Win a Best Actor Academy Award episode, 80% of you showed the love to Leonardo DiCaprio, giving him an honorary nod for Best Actor. Actor. Got all that? Good. No new one this week, cause that was a lot. But in case you missed any of those previous episodes, here they are. If you ask me, the Fifty Shades of Grey one might be my favorite theory we've done in a while. Plus, it's got cinema sins, so extra win there. Now if you'll excuse me, this end slate has gotten too long, and I've got a date with some dwarves, so I'll see you next time.
late too. Well, hate to break it to you, you youth of the nation, because today we're talking about Seinfeld. No, this episode wasn't pulled from BuzzFeed's latest 90s nostalgia list, 27 struggles that were all too real to 90s kids. We're talking about the series that's widely considered to be the best sitcom of all- <laughs> Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, where sometimes we do episodes that aren't about Game of Thrones! So maybe now you're breathing a sigh of relief because you're like, Finally, Film Theory will be covering a show I've actually seen! Something that I can rel- Hello, we know you're a comedian, but this is a sitcom, so get to the episode already. Am I right? <laughs> I know that Tot Pat of 1995 loved it, and now the series just had a recent resurgence over one specific episode that I just had to talk about. A couple weeks ago, one of the show's stars, Jason Alexander, appeared on the Howard Stern Show to talk about his character, George Costanza. I would say that he's the unloved. You remember that dress that swept the internet a couple months ago? I mean, what's the deal with that? It's like, was it black? Was it gold? Pick a color and stick with it, am I right? And, uh, what about that 90s show, Seinfeld, that started every episode with a stand-up bit? It's like, 